Hospital Pharmacy, Past, Present, and Future. Hi again, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Farm Easy Tutor. My name is Ken Atto, and as many of you know, I've been a hospital pharmacist for almost 40 years. In this installment, I wanted to spend some time talking about my experiences and observations as a hospital pharmacist since I started working in the early 1980s and to show the many changes our profession has undergone over the past several years. I also wanted to spend some time discussing where we are at today and the many opportunities hospital pharmacists have in store for the future. So let's begin by talking about how my career first got started. Picture a hospital in the late 1970s and how it evolved in the 80s. In the past, would you believe that pills were dispensed by nurses to patients from bottles? Nurses injected additives into IV bottles on counters. All the patient medical records were on paper. And patients having cataract surgeries were in the hospital for over a week. Now all medications are dispensed in unit dose or unit of use packaging to patients. Pharmacy services took over IV additives to ensure sterile product preparation. Today, all medical records are fully computerized and cataract surgeries are performed in an outpatient setting in one afternoon. As far as the hospital infrastructure, the pharmacy was mostly centralized in one location often relegated to the basement area of the hospital. With time, decentralized satellite pharmacies located close to patient care areas sprouted up. With access to computerization, this now enabled pharmacists to be closer to patients, nurses, and doctors. The role of the clinical pharmacist was created. The development of the clinical pharmacist occurred in the 1970s and 1980s. Those pharmacists were the pioneers of our profession. Physicians deferred many of their responsibilities to pharmacists because they knew pharmacists could do a better job. These tasks included pharmacokinetic dosing and drug monitoring. Drugs with narrow therapeutic windows and high toxicity were difficult to manage so pharmacists could take over and monitor these drugs closely. These drugs included am aminoglycosides, aminophilin, digoxin, and phenytoin. They followed per pharmacy dosing protocols. Another example of where pharmacists took over the dosing was with TPN monitoring. The pharmacists followed per pharmacy formula selection and made daily electrolyte changes. Many pharmacists were even team members of nutritional support services. Another area where pharmacists could do a better job than physicians was with warfarin dosing and monitoring. Warfarin is a powerful anticoagulant with a very narrow therapeutic window. Dosing per pharmacy protocol was essential to prevent drug-induced bleeding. For our patients, Pharmacists served in Coumadin clinics. The pharmacists emphasized to patients the importance for compliance and follow-up appointments to test their INRs. Another area of expertise by pharmacists was with chemotherapy preparation. Pharmacists prepared chemotherapy in vertical flow hoods, and they participated and got involved with patient-specific regimens regarding the chemotherapy dosages. They also monitored and managed chemotherapy-induced side effects that the patients were experiencing. Pharmacists participated in performing DUEs. What's a DUE? A drug use evaluation. In the 1980s, pharmacists started to develop interest in performing audits to see how drugs are being used. In other words, once a drug leaves the pharmacy after dispensing, we need to investigate how it is being used. We look for the key DUE criteria. Is it being used for the correct indication and dosage? Is it causing any side effects? And what is the therapeutic outcome of using the drug? When should we do a DUE? When a drug is high cost or high use and or high toxicity. 
A DUE can be performed on as little as 20 patients in the hospital or as much as tens of thousands in a managed care program. In the 1980s, there were significant changes in the hospital model and how hospitals functioned. A nursing model became a business model. Nonprofit organizations became for-profit organizations. In managed care, the emergence of HMOs or health maintenance organizations, for example, Kaiser, came to fruition. And the focus on clinical therapy changed to a focus on cost savings. So hospitals tried to find ways to become more efficient, to save money and to stay competitive. How could hospitals save money? By tightening and downsizing that occurred in the 1990s. Hospitals tried to get their patients out faster to reduce their lengths of stay. They transitioned them to the home healthcare business, which was lucrative for pharmacists. Ambulatory infusion centers were built and outpatient surgeries were emphasized to get the patients out of the hospital and have procedures done on outpatient settings. And surgery medications were identified as big spending items and so surgery pharmacists were developed to control those costs. Insurance companies wanted to save money too. The biggest insurance company is the federal government's CMS or Center for Medicare and Medicaid, which created what's known as a DRG or diagnosis related group. A DRG is a spending limit. It's the most that insurers will pay to providers based on a diagnosis or procedure. CMS also developed quality measures, which is the same as JCO's core measures. This means that hospitals needed to submit clinical data to the government and low scores reflected reduced hospital reimbursement dollars. What has changed over the years or things that we don't do anymore? As far as kinetics, aminoglycoside use significantly declined due to the approval of safer antibiotics, cephalosporins and quinolones. However, increased use of vancomycin due to emergence of MRSA led to continued dosing and monitoring per pharmacy. Aminophilin and digoxin are now rarely used. Phenytoin has been replaced by newer, safer agents. TPN was considered dangerous, and so that decreased the amount of TPN being used. There was a greater emphasis on gut feeding to preserve the microbiome. And studies showed that there was no need for IV nutrition for five to seven days, unless the patient is malnourished. As far as anticoagulation, heparin has been mostly replaced by low molecular weight heparin, such as Lobinox. Warfarin has been primarily replaced by DOAX, such as Eliquis or Xarelto. So with the reduced use of warfarin, there was a big downsizing of Coumadin clinics. Regarding chemotherapy, less toxic biologic agents have been developed and administered, and many of these agents are orally administered. Governmental quality measures are still important today. CMS core measures such as pneumonia, vaccination rates, sepsis, stroke, and COPD data are still being required to be submitted to the federal government. CMS readmission penalties are still assessed for inappropriate readmissions. And the CDC may soon require antibiogram and antibiotic consumption data to be downloaded from hospitals for assessment. Other current topics include pharmacy working with insurance companies to get prior authorization to dispense many expensive drugs. Biosimilars, can the biologics be replaced by their biosimilar counterparts, similar to generic drugs? And with COVID-19 present, keeping up with the therapeutic antivirals for COVID-19, those both used investigationally and those after marketing. The good news for the future is that there are so many exciting opportunities in pharmacy to look forward to. 
Here are some areas of specialization for pharmacists. Antimicrobial stewardship pharmacists, emergency department pharmacists, critical care pharmacists, surgery pharmacists, oncology pharmacists, both adult and pediatric, and neonatal and pediatric pharmacists. Other areas of specialization include pain management pharmacists, transitional care pharmacists that perform meds to beds, pharmacist informatics specialists, and HIV specialists. Additional areas of specialization include investigational drug experts, 340B reimbursement specialists, and specialty pharmacies that control expensive drugs such as oral chemotherapy. Here are some changes in the way the hospital infrastructure will look in the future. With increasing technologies, this will lead to decreased hospital lengths of stay. Hospitals will look a lot different. Many procedures currently done inpatient now will be performed outpatient, such as with orthopedic procedures. There will also be a significant impact of COVID. Investigational and approved antivirals will proliferate. These will create a high cost and increased need to monitor for toxicities. In California, there were several laws recently passed that enabled the pharmacist to practice independently in an outpatient and clinic setting. One was called SB 493, which was passed in 2013. This law created the Advanced Practice Pharmacist. This pharmacist can administer drugs, including injections, immunizations, travel meds, contraception, nicotine replacement can be given per approved protocol. One offshoot of this law was AB 1535, which allows pharmacists to furnish naloxone without a prescription. In 2019, California law passed AB 1114. This gave the pharmacist provider status, allowing reimbursement for SB 493 services. It authorized pharmacists to obtain Medi-Cal payments for providing immunizations, contraception, smoking cessation, and travel medication services authorized by SB 493. Medi-Cal is California's Medicaid healthcare program. Provider status legislation is widely understood to mean a law that would allow pharmacists to bill for and get reimbursed for their patient care services. So the big question for the future is, is there an oversupply of pharmacists? To answer if there's an oversupply of pharmacists, we have to weigh supply and demand. Regarding supply, in California, there are currently 14 schools of pharmacy providing ACPE accredited PharmD programs. California has more than any other state. PGY2 programs are growing, as well as board certification for BCPS. On the demand side, as I listed previously, there are numerous pharmacist specialist positions that are being opened up. COVID is going to require additional needs for antivirals, immunotherapies, and vaccination. And in the retail setting, patient counseling, automation, and advanced practice pharmacists and provider status are currently being incorporated into practice. So what do you think? As far as what was presented, the demand seems to be greater than the supply. And so I think for hospital pharmacy's future, the future looks bright. I hope you enjoyed our trip back in time that reviewed the evolution and development of hospital pharmacy over the years, its past and present, and promise for the future. We've got a lot in store at the PharmEasy Tutor Channel. There will be upcoming talks on the five events that changed hospital pharmacy, anticoagulation, electrolyte management, and quinolone side effects, and much more. So please stay tuned to us. Thanks for tuning in to watch this installment of the PharmEasy Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use at school or in practice. 
If you'd like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube, please make sure to click on the subscribe button below to change it from red to gray. Also, if you like this video, I would appreciate it if you can click on the thumbs up icon below to change the color to blue. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to add them in the comment section below or share this site with someone else. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy.